Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are in conversation with Professor Biswajit Dar, who is a well-known trade expert. He's been on several official committees of the Government of India. He's currently Professor of Economics at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at the Jawaharlal Nehru University here in New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Dar, welcome uh, to News Click and thank you for your thank time. You. To begin with, uh, the sort of root for economic integration no longer seems to be the World Trade Organization. Rather, countries are now engaging in mega free trade agreements or what are called the mega regionals. There were three on the block with the ascendancy of the Trump presidency, uh, two of them, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Trans-Atlantic uh, Investment Partnership have been shelved. And the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which India is part of along with 15 other countries, is the main trade agreement, which if concluded is likely to be the world's largest free trade area. Can you give us a sense of what is the RCEP and what are the issues covered under it? Yeah, RCEP is basically a agglomeration mm -hmm. of uh, countries with, with whom ASEAN has had a free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's also called an uh, ASEAN plus one FTA. And uh, the, the lead for uh, RCEP was taken by the ASEAN. And it's very interesting that ASEAN took this initiative when it itself was trying to form an economic uh, union, mm -hmm. um, customs union. Uh, they call it the ASEAN Economic Community. Uh, so one major um, issue around RCEP is the ASEAN centrality. Yeah? So it is driven by the ASEAN. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in the course of the negotiations, other countries have I've pitched in, in in various ways, but the momentum actually comes from uh, from the uh, ASEAN countries. The, the other interesting dimension of uh, RCEP is is that uh, um, of the 16 countries involved, uh, seven countries were already part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. and uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as we all know, uh, had an agenda for uh, uh, taking the uh, trade integration or what we could call the level of uh, openness to a very different level. Uh, they were actually talking about virtually zero tariffs and um, all the rules were um, uh, formed in such a way that it would help the global value chains. In other words, the, the multinationals who are sort of leading these or uh, driving these value chains uh, were the focus of attention in, in, in TPP. Yeah? Uh, so all the rules were formulated around, mm -hmm. you know, the concerns or the interests of the multinationals. So when these seven countries were uh, uh, a part of this TPP, and uh, so they, they in a way brought some of the TPP agenda on to our set. Uh, we haven't seen this kind of uh, 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 discussion on a regime which is talking about virtually zero tariffs across the board. We'll come to the point that you've raised about tariff reductions and, and the sensitivities vis-a-vis uh, -vis that. But just before that, I want you to give us a sense of uh, the fact that India is already implementing several FTA, some of them with RCEP country. We don't have an FTA with China, for instance. Um, so what's been India's record on the trade front so far, and is that informing the negotiating positions. Yeah, you see, we have uh, three FTAs with uh, the RCEP, uh, uh, you know, countries. One is, of course, with the ten-member uh, ASEAN, mm -hmm. then with Japan and Korea, and two other FTAs are in the works uh, with uh, with Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. Now, if you look at these, the three FTAs which are already being in implemented, and this is from around 2010-11. So we have. Uh, you know, at least six, seven years of uh, data to look at what has actually happened, you find that the, the record has been very dismal. That's, the, you know, there's only one headline there, uh, uh, very dismal uh, uh, in terms of uh, our export uh, penetration into these markets. Yeah? If you look at the other side, if you look at the imports, and the imports have steadily increased. So the trade imbalance in some countries <coughs> with some partners is so large that they are sev they are the, the trade imbalance is several times the India's exports. Like you mentioned that uh, RCEP is is very important because we have this big elephant waiting to 
you know, sort of really, you know, sort of take over the room completely. They are already there in the room in a ma ma big way. That is China. And uh, China's, if I look at China's, uh, uh, you know, penetration into India and also compare it with the other side, India's penetration into China, it just tells you a story there. In 2004-05, India's uh, exports to China was in the range of, uh, you know, about five and a half billion dollars. And uh, the trade deficit with China, China was about $1.5 billion. And if, if you look at uh, 2016, the latest uh, numbers that are available, the trade deficit has gone up to uh, more than $51 billion. And India's exports have gone from $5 billion in 2004 5 to just about $10 billion. Yeah? So you can just see what's actually happened. You know, China's exports to India have increased by more than nine times. And India's exports to China increase not even by, you know, a factor of two. Hmm. So uh, it's not a question of, you know, being, you know, sort of pessimistic about Im imports. Yeah, but certainly for a country like India, we need to be worried about our, our uh, you know, trade deficit and the current account deficit. But if you look at uh, the media reports, it looks like the government is apprised of this because um, India seems to be holding out in terms of uh, massive reductions of tariffs in manufacturing and in agriculture. It had proposed a three-tiered formula, but it recognizes that there are sort of losses because we have the highest tariffs. So what are some of the sort of sectors that you see are of concern in terms of jobs, especially in agriculture and in manufacturing? No, I think, you know, we need to be, you know, you're right, you know, the government is now worried huh, because uh, when we made our initial offers of tariff cuts uh, about two years back, um, we had, uh, you know, conveyed very clearly that we are not going to give China uh, adic adic the market, kind of market access that they're looking for in terms of preferential tariffs. Yeah? So while um, we offered uh, uh, tariff elimination, or ASEAN, the extent of 80-85% for China, it was about 42%, 42-43%. Yeah? But that didn't sail. Now what does it mean, like you're asking uh, in real terms? Um, uh, you know, one is of course uh, that uh, small and medium enterprises, many of the in Indian uh, you know, manufacturing uh, units, uh, have already, f we, you know, sort of, uh, have, al have already f faced this kind of a problem. And with China just coming in and sort of rolling over, um, uh, I see that, uh, you know, the, the future of all this, you know, make in India kind of a thing is going to be uh, uh, seriously in, 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 tr in trouble. I do not see how, uh, you know, the government can do uh, this kind of a make in India, you know, turn around the manufacturing sector with this kind of open door policy. You know, there has to be certain uh, extent of uh, uh, tariff protection, some uh, way of supporting the industry. Uh, other, otherwise, they'll just get uh, completely knocked over. And, and and let us also recognize the fact that the the big jobs that the government is actually was expecting right from day one it's uh, you know when it came into power those jobs will only take place uh, will come from the sme sector they can't come from the big uh, you know uh, big companies the big companies are actually shedding jobs you know? so uh, so i'm really concerned about that then there's the big issue of agriculture and and uh, you know um, we are now negotiating with uh, two countries, uh, spe especially uh, you know Australia and New Zealand, uh, uh, which are big agricultural exporters. Huh? So so both in terms of the uh, you know the, the, the grains and uh, and the dairy products, uh, they will be under pressure. Yeah? And um, yeah, we know for a fact that. Uh, our levels of efficiency is not great. Yeah, so unless something is done immediately, and I don't know what it's going to, how it can be done, uh, we will not be able to compete. No, but the response the government would have to your criticism would be that you know trade negotiations are about give and take, and we have massive offensive interests and much to gain in the services sector, uh, in terms of the IT sector. India's <coughs> commerce minister has said that we want more what is called mode 4 access for temporary movement of software professionals. 
but this is also coming in the context of you know media reports in the last few days of massive job cuts in the IT sector. So this whole sort of services gain, uh, how would you sort of evaluate that position of right. job? Now in the services sector, uh, you know, if you look at uh, um, all the big services uh, areas, hmm, India is in a in a in a uh, you know on, on the back foot. So look at financial services, you know, uh, look at uh, education services, look at telecommunication. Yeah, uh, at one point uh, there was a lot of glib talk about health services and education services where India would be a net exporter of, of services. But the point is that when these two sectors, we do not have professionals who adequate number of professionals to serve our own people. You know, how can you actually think of uh, exporting uh, services in these two areas? So I think if, if it happens, it's very unfortunate because then, you know, you're, you left, you're leaving your own countrymen uh, to suffer. Uh, yeah. Uh, now on on IT, uh, the scenario is bleak, and uh, what you are, uh, uh, you know, you're looking at um, uh, job cuts by these major companies, mm -hmm. uh, and and this is just the beginning. This is just the tip of the iceberg. It's going to uh, be quite uh, significant uh, moving on, and and the reason is uh, automation. Yeah, the kind of robotization that we are seeing today, yeah? and. And, and uh, this is something that uh, the media has not reported very well, that India is among the top countries uh, using robots. You know, recently, three, three, four days back, I was a report in the, one of the newspapers on the robotization in, uh, in the Suzuki factory. Um, you know, the, so, so you're actually looking at that kind of robotization that uh, is, is happening. So which means that, um, you know, uh, there will be massive job cuts. So moving forward, uh, um, uh, you know, mode mode four uh, was uh, was uh, mode four. I would say was never an option. And after uh, nine eleven, uh, I think uh, it has it ceased to be an option uh, in realistic terms. You know, no country will allow the kind of migration. Um, uh, in that India is talking about. It's just not possible. Yeah, Dr. Dark, to conclude, uh, one of the key concerns for civil society groups monitoring the negotiations has been the sort of lack of transparency and the secrecy. There are no texts available. Uh, for instance, the Kerala government has sort of put out a public statement saying that they want to be part of the consultations also because of the impacts they've seen because of the India, Sri Lanka and the ASEAN India agreement. And given that uh, you're increasingly seeing intrusions into federal policy spaces, do you see the need for an overhaul of India's trade policy sort of making mechanisms itself? No, certainly. I think it needs a, is a, complete, needs a complete overhaul. Right from the beginning of the, this phase uh, of uh, you know, serious engagement with FTAs in India. Uh, and uh, we have been actually trying to make the point that uh, there has to be serious consultation with all the stakeholders. And, uh, uh, and, the, and the stakeholders should actually drive the agenda. Like it happens in most of the mature economies. Now, this government has been talking about cooperative federalism. Yeah? Now, cooperative federalism, uh, we haven't seen much of uh, this. We haven't seen that we have got much evidence in the last uh, most three years. But I think there is a, an opportunity for this, con this government to show that it believes in fe cooperative federalism by engaging with all the state governments and then to uh, work out a position based on the concerns that the state governments have. At the same time, uh, I think it is very important for the, the, uh, the government to uh, listen to the civil society. Because in many of these areas, like for instance agriculture, we don't have these farmers organizations like we have in the West. You know, the civil society which carries the message from, you know, the ground, uh, ground below, from the fields and uh, raises concerns. So it is very important for the government to understand about agriculture and that it can only do by talking to the civil society organization. There is no other way I can look at. Uh, you know this uh, thing being addressed. The RCEP countries are looking at um, 
early 2018 as the you know sort of some kind of a sort of the uh, for clinching the deal and unless india does takes a position right away i think is 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 going to be a kind of a disastrous venture so i hope uh, you know we can all sort of uh, make the government see sense uh, and to take a more realistic uh, position and a, and a more proactive position to make uh, our voice heard thank you very much dr dar and as you know india will host the 19th trade negotiations round in the city of hyderabad in july and as the uh, sort of negotiations speed up then we hope to come back to you for more analysis thank you very much my pleasure thanks